Hi, Massimo. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm not complaining at all today. Let me introduce us. Uh, I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and the audio podcast. You are Massimo... Should I say Puliu? No, that's two. It's not... It, the, the first syllable is not, a, it's not quite a poo, right? Uh, what, what is the absolutely correct... <laughs> what is the... A, I mean, it's an I. It's P-I. Right. And the G is... Not quite silent, but mostly. So it's Piliucci. Pilu- no, I, I give up. You're Massimo. Hi, Massimo. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, you are famous Stoic, author of <laughs> How to Be a Stoic, uh, right. famous reviver of the Stoic tradition, even as we speak. It's a, it's a, it's a movement of growing momentum. You are, you're at the forefront. Congratulations. Um, Somewhere over there, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it is a happening thing. Uh, yeah, and uh, we talked in the past actually about connections to Buddhism, which I've written about. Uh, but yes. that's that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about something else that does intersect with Stoicism, and this is the concept of the logos. Now, it's a Greek concept. Let me tell you how. I'm not sure you know how I came to ask you if you wanted to talk about this. Here's how it happened. No, I'm kind of curious actually. <laughs> okay. So surely you've heard of Jordan Peterson. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I was just writing about him a minute ago. Were you? Really? Well, I was I was uh, tweeting about him, and I discovered that if I want to increase the traffic on my Twitter feed, all I need to do is to talk about Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, or Ayn Rand. Not that they have much in common other than that, but that's about it. Hmm. I'm trying to think of what the intersection would be. Uh, well, Ayn Rand was an atheist. Uh, yeah. But Jordan Peterson is not, which actually kind of leads us back into this. So Jordan Peterson, if, if there's anybody who's managed to escape awareness of him somehow, you know, he's this Canadian psychologist who bursts on the scene by initially by standing in opposition to what he might call legally compelled uh, political correctness. But in any event, he bursts on the scene and it turns out he's got this whole worldview that he's very successfully uh, gotten out there. It's... Um, there's what's his book, Twelve Rules for Living or something, but uh, Twelve Rules. I forgot what the, the and, and then, and then he had an earlier book called Maps of Meaning. Anyway, uh, I um, I discovered that he was talking about the logos, uh, and yeah. uh, I thought, well, wow, I've written about the logos. I wrote about it in my book, The Evolution of God. That's interesting. Um, and so somebody said, well, you should talk about the logos. I still honestly haven't. Uh, gotten much into what he's saying about the logos but but it kind of makes sense for him i think because uh you know one thing he's doing i think is providing people a way to think of themselves as religious without buying into any kind of archaic seeming conceptions of god or anything or maybe any conception of god it's unclear exactly what he's up to but i think you could say that in some vague sense i think that's a fair statement it's yeah, unclear it, what he's it's up a little to. hard to figure out but there is some kind of attempt to to reconcile a modern worldview with a religious sensibility, I think. And uh, I think of the Logos as uh, really, even back in Greek times, as being sometimes used uh, in that effort. Um, I, I What I wrote about in The Evolution of God was Philo of Alexandria's use of the concept of the Logos. He right. was very much interested in reconciling his kind of Jewish faith with a Greek milieu, including Greek philosophy. Yes. Uh, and and the concept of the Logos is kind of, in some ways, on the borderline between theology and philosophy, or at least it can be, it can be made to sit there, as, yes. as he did. So it's a very interesting, I, I think it's a fascinating concept. I said in my book, if you want to you know, look for a theology that you could call kind of scientifically respectable. Um, the Logos uh, is probably something you should look into, the idea of the Logos. And by the way, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the first, you know, in the book of John, when it says, in the beginning was the word, uh, the word that's translated as word is the Greek word Logos. And presumably that verse would have, back when it was written, would have had a whole philosophical resonance for people that we don't get when we just see uh, in the beginning was the word. I mean, that, that phrase is suggestive, oh. you know, equating God with the word, but it wouldn't have the same meaning for us. 
Um, yep. So why don't we start by you giving us your take on the logos, how you describe it to how you would describe it to a philosophy one on one student. So before we get there, actually, it's, it's, so it's this is very interesting and kind, kind of coincidental because I had no idea that you got started from from Peterson. And that was my arrival, point of arrival recently, actually, because I, I was uh, looking over my notes on the history of logos. And the very last entry that I have is on Carl Jung which is, in fact, the uh, inspiration for, uh, for Peterson. And maybe at some point today we're going to get into why, uh, in fact, Jung, Jung was, brought the logo way outside of uh, what the Greeks actually thought, and I think in the wrong direction, uh, frankly. I didn't, which means, I didn't know he used the concept at all. Yeah, it, it, it did, um, and, in fact, he used it in a way very similar, of course, in the way in which Peterson then inherited it from, inherited it from him. Uh, which also, if you want, might want to might get us to a brief discussion of Peterson. But first of all, you know, let's get the beginning. So logos was a uh, very common concept in ancient Greek philosophy, even in the, among the pre-Socratics. So we're talking about 5th century BC. Uh, mm-hmm. BC. Uh, however, the first pre-Socratic philosopher that is explicitly associated with it and gave several definitions of it, it's Heraclitus. And is, is Heraclitus... Who? Is who? Heraclitus. Oh, Heraclitus, okay. Heraclitus is otherwise famous uh, for being the one that said that uh, you never step in the same river twice, right? His, uh, uh, his basic concept uh, is often summarized in the phrase, in the Greek phrase, uh, pantare, everything changes, right? everything is in flux. Uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting, Heraclitus is interesting for a variety of reasons. He was a major um, inspiration to the Stoics, and in fact, he was the guy that put on the map what today modern philosophers call process metaphysics. Hmm. Uh, so the idea that there are no objects, that, that the ultimate structures of the universe are not objects, but are processes. Or events. Fluxes. Or uh, Events are more, are more fundamental than things. Correct. So this is, so, and there is a process people. theology, and I assume both are associated with Alfred North Whitehead, right? Yes, process uh, uh, theology is, although that's that's a different, uh, significantly different concept, I think, from okay. process metaphysics. The process metaphysics really is about uh, this idea that goes back to Heraclitus, that, that as you just put it, that processes are more fundamental than uh, than uh, than objects, uh, which, as you know, uh, is actually, I assume, resonates pretty well also from a Buddhist perspective. Um, I think and, so. And well, certainly, right. the impermanence you just mentioned, and that everything is in flux, does. And 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 I, I had never actually heard the connection before. Uh, yeah, but I would say, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty Buddhist. Yeah, yeah, and also resonates quite a bit actually with uh, modern fundamental physics, um, because there are a number of interesting uh, sort of takes on modern uh, physics, either from theoretical physicists or from some philosophers of physics that essentially go down to the to the point of, you know, when you go at the very bottom of reality, you don't actually find objects, you find processes. Okay, so now the thing is, Heraclitus uh, it's in self-aware, it's kind of difficult to understand for a variety of reasons. First of all, we only have fragments of his writings. We don't have any, any full book. And can you tell us when did he, when was he writing? He was writing between the... Uh, late 500 and, er, and, uh, and early 400s, so you know, fifth so, century. And he was and he was talking about the logos then. Yes, in because, fact, because he Philo was one, Philo wasn't until first century CE. Right. So, and in fact, I think that everything about the logos, pretty much everything about the logos in the Western tradition, and that includes Christians, uh, some aspect of the Jewish tradition, as well as, in fact. Uh, um, Muslim, you know, um, Islamic philosophy, uh, some aspects of Islamic philosophy actually go back all the way to the pre-Socratics and particularly to Heraclitus as far as the Logos is concerned. Mm-hmm. Now, Heraclitus gave different definitions and what we can tell from it is that he interpreted the Logos in a, in a number of ways, but the most fundamental was the Logos is the principle, the generative principle of the universe is whatever it is that organized the universe the way it is in fact organized. Now, you can go from there in a number of different directions. So you can just say that the logos is simply whatever description, intelligible description of the universe we have. That's what um, more recently people called uh, Spinoza's God or, or Einstein's God. This, this idea that, look, uh, at the bottom there are the laws of nature and the logos is the presentation of the laws of nature. 
That's the most non-theistic interpretation I think you could give. The Stoics were somewhere in between. The Stoics thought that the Logos was, in fact, again, the, the sort of the generative principle of the universe. They actually called it the Logos Spermaticos, the, 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 literally the origin, the originator of the universe. They thought of it as a god, but as a god made of matter. And, in fact, they identified that god with the universe itself. So it's the, it's pantheism, if you, if you will. So, so, so they thought of the Logos itself as a god? As God, they, as they God. didn't have more than as, as God, but they also identified that God with matter and with the entirety of the universe. So, you know, this is a pantheistic position. Right. So, so that is, is that, is that standard Stoic theology is kind of pantheistic in that way? And that was the way they deployed the logos? Yes, that's right. The okay. ancient Stoic definitely uh, uh, pantheists. Now, when the concept got into uh, Christianity, as you mentioned, uh, the Gospel of John, for instance, um, but there are other places. I mean, uh, uh, you know, some of the several of the early first church fathers wrote about it, and especially Augustine uh, wrote about the logos. And they, of course, interpreted it as um, um, under a Neoplatonist kind of influence, as either an attribute of God. So often, for instance, in the especially in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus Christ is identified with the logos. He, he is the logos. Um, and then other versions of Christianity identified as the principle that is necessary to connect the divine with the human, right? right? That's also the Neoplatonic uh, Platonic, uh, view. And, and in fact, if I could interject, I would say I think the way Philo used it was, among other things, as on the one hand, he wanted to remove himself from the conception of an anthropomorphic god, throwing thunderbolts. He wanted to think of God as, in some sense, transcendent. But then there needed to be some kind of connection between a transcendent right. God and us and our lives. And I think the Logos, as this kind of like animating logic or something imparted by God initially to, yeah. to the material world, uh, yeah. served that kind of connective function. That's exactly right. Uh, and in fact, so Plotinus was, of course, a Neoplatonist, was influenced by Plato and greatly influenced the early church fathers. You know, Plato, as, as we know, uh, had this idea of, of this, this bim bimodal world, if you will, right? The, the world of the forms, the ideal, the ideal uh, world, and then the world of, of the reality as we perceive it, right? Um, and he also needed a connection between those two. So how is it that uh, the world as it is is a sort of a pale reflection of, of the forms? And Plotin Plotinus thought that, well, the connection is the logos. The logos is what's ne needed to put the glue, basically, between the the world of forms and the world as we understand it. So it's it's got a really interesting history. Now, of course, another part of that history goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle thought uh, interpreted the logos in a in a different way, but in in, in a way that is actually still uh, influenced in turn by Heraclitus, by one of the, the different meanings that Heraclitus put to the word associated with the word. That is, let's not forget, logos is where also the word logic comes from. Mm -hmm. Right. So Aristotle wrote in the rhetoric that uh, if you want to make a persuasive argument with uh, with people, you have to build your argument around three uh, different but interrelated uh, sort of factors. One was the logos. That is, you have to have a good argument based on facts and reason uh, that you want to put forth. That's the logos for Aristotle. You also have to have the um, ethos. That is, you have to be able to establish your credentials as a principled person, as a person of character. That is, somebody can be trusted, basically, mm -hmm. with the audience. And then the pathos. You have to make the emotional connection. You have to explain to people why is it that they give a damn about what you're talking about. It is unfortunate, I think, that this is a side note compared to, you know, in terms of our discussion today. It is unfortunate that a lot of uh, modern scientists and philosophers completely seem to have forgotten about both the pathos and the ethos. And they go to, they, they're convinced that if they just give the logos, if they just give the reasons, then everybody will, will agree. And as we know, that just doesn't work that way. <laughs> but Aristotle would not have been surprised. So that's the, a separate stream, uh, but it is interesting because, as I said, that's, that's where logic comes from, this mm -hmm. idea that you can explain things in a logical manner. Now, the two are connected mm -hmm. by the uh, idea that goes back to the Stoic that uh, – we can understand the world precisely because it is organized, mm -hmm. like, right, by according to rational principles. And that, frankly, you don't need to be a, a pantheist or a theist to accept that that idea. 
I mean, yes, obviously, we, we have science, uh, and science can make progress precisely because the world, for whatever reason, uh, appears to be organized according to rational principles that are understandable by human, uh, human logic. So that's a short version of it. Now, the, the bit that is missing there is the jump from the Christian theologians all the way to Carl Jung. And I don't know if you want to talk about it right now or, or if you want well, to go back to that. I would just pause and say, uh, like, one or two other things before we move there, if we could, uh, uh, which is that I, I think, um, so anyway, as you said, it's a very rich word. I mean, I gather that it was the noun form of the verb to speak and of the verb to count, or, you know, so, it, so you, could, yeah. you, could, you could see it as, like, the well, the, you can see why it was translated as the word in uh, in John, um, or an accounting, um, and I and I think then the way it connects to our word the logic, uh, the word logic, has maybe two facets. As uh, you as you suggested, on the one hand, um, it suggests there's there's nature is intelligible. We can figure out the laws, but also, and I don't know how early this this idea enters it or or or. Uh, but I mean, certainly by Philo's time, there is the idea that there is a logic to the, to these, this animating, these animating laws that you could call them the scientific laws, but, but Philo's point would be, there's a logic to them, not just in the sense that we can understand them, but in the sense that they're not aimless. They're leading, they're, they're leading us somewhere. They're leading the universe, uh, somewhere. I mean, it's clearly a teleological, worldview yeah. there's a purpose embedded in the logo so you can see it as kind of like the unfolding i mean in modern terms i'm tempted to use the word algorithm there's like the unfolding of an algorithm of a of a, of a logical kind of program and the other thing i'd i'd say um is is the logo certainly in philo's rendering is closely associated with the concept of wisdom Right. Yes. So so there is, you know, uh, Sophia is, of course, the goddess of wisdom, as you know, having uh, been on on Dan Kaufman's uh, show, Sophia repeatedly, which is available right. on Meaning of Life TV. Um, and uh, um, and there is this idea uh, again, I don't know if the, if the Stoics would pick up on this, but I think uh, Philo certainly held it that the logos leads you to wisdom. I mean, the the living your life uh, uh, in accordance with kind of the logic of life, living your life in accordance with the un this unfolding logic, the world we find ourselves in, uh, living it um, uh, well in, in a sense, just just you know, living a life of enlightened self interest will lead you to wisdom. There's there's a wisdom embedded in the unfolding of the universe, and it's up to us to perceive that and act in accordance with it. That's certainly part of uh, Philo's rendering. Yes, that's right. You find that, that also in the Stoics. Um, and actually, that's the one that you just highlighted is uh, a major uh, distinction between sort of ancient Stoicism and, and more modern versions of it. So the ancient Stoics uh, had both, all of the elements that you just mentioned. They did think that the universe, they had a teleological version of the view of the universe. The universe is, was, was a living organism that was doing its own thing, and it was doing what it was best for itself. Mm -hmm. And since we are part of that organism, then, as you just said, yes, it makes perfect sense to try to understand what the organism is up to, basically, and live accordingly. In fact, one of the, stoic, the famous Stoic um, mottos was live according to nature, by right? which they meant understand how the universe works and adjust your behavior accordingly, because to pretend that the universe works in a different way, it's a foolish thing to do. It's, it's a recipe for, uh, for, for disaster. Right. So, yes, in a very important sense, to be wise means to understand how things work and adjust accordingly, adjust your expectations accordingly, adjust your behavior accordingly. Right. And, and now, the, well, just yeah. the, the wisdom literature, including the, the wisdom books in the Hebrew Bible, are, very, are pretty explicit in, in connecting self-interest to wise, to virtuous behavior. The idea is that, Enlightened self-interest leads to um, kind of virtuous behavior. Um, yeah. And, and then the other thing I'd say is that I believe uh, I believe somebody, uh, I, I think Sophia says in the Hebrew Bible uh, in a way that, uh, you know, you wouldn't, uh, probably translations wouldn't render this as the goddess Sophia, but I think Sophia speaks and says, 
I was there at the beginning. God, God uh, brought, you know, uh, infused kind of the world. I don't know how she puts it, but the idea is that at the very beginning, this kind of logic of wisdom was imparted to the world. Okay, so that's just a footnote. Go so, ahead. So there is, there is that. Now, the, the Soics did not have a concept that it would translate to enlightened self-interest, although they had something similar. They basically thought that because we're all interconnected and because we're all members of the human polis, uh, basically, by helping others, you help yourself, and vice versa. By helping yourself, you help you help others. But but the the basic idea that wisdom re- uh, resides in understanding how the world works and acting accordingly uh, is definitely there, and they derive that from the logos. Now, the modern story, modern stories, most modern stories at least, drop the teleological part. Uh, so we don't you know we don't believe that the universe is a living organism that does its own thing. But we do retain the the, the important kernel, which is Nonetheless, it is important to to understand how the universe works and act accordingly. Uh, in this sense, let me give you an example. So you probably remember years ago there was this uh, bizarre uh, book that came out called uh, um, The Secret. Oh, yeah. uh, with right, it's, it's so, an so Oprah. That, that's an Oprah sensation. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, The Secret basically assumes a metaphysics that is very different from the one we are we are. Sort of, we tend to agree on, which is this idea that the universe tends to sort of uh, change itself or adjust itself to essentially your wishes. If you wish something, if you want something really strong enough, then the universe is going to sort of somehow uh, change in, in, in a way that accords with your wishes. The Stoics would have said, no, that's unwise. That's foolish. The universe does, isn't going to do that sort of stuff. You have to you adapt have to, to it. Adapt. It doesn't adapt to you. Exactly. <laughs> Precisely. So, so accepting. So, you know, people often, when they think about oh, metaphysics, they, they, it's it's often portrayed as the the least practical of uh, of the subdisciplines of philosophy. But it isn't. It depends on what you mean by metaphysics. If if you really understand the universe in a way that it's very different from the way it is, then your life is going to have you know it's going to be problematic. Mm-hmm. You're going to not have a good life. Now, when you talk about the modern Stoics. When does that begin? What what era? So you're talking about people, they're no longer thinking of the Logos theologically, not even in the sense of pantheism, not even in the sense that the universe kind of is God? So uh, by modern stories, I actually really mean very recent stuff, like 20th century okay. and 21st okay. century. We're talking very recent stuff. Um, no, I would say, so I think of it that way. I think of the Logos not in theological right. terms, not in... Uh, you know, in those in those terms, I just think of uh, the logos as the structure, the, the, the rational structure of the universe. However, that originated. However, no, I wouldn't say that that's a mandatory thing for a modern stoic. One of the things that I do like about modern stoicism is that it is, in fact, ecumenical in terms of metaphysics. If you are a Christian, you can still be a stoic, and you understand the logos as the word of God. If you are a pantheist, then you're fine because you are among the, the you know you're following the same tradition as the ancient stoics. But a lot of my sense is that a lot of modern Stoics are neither. Uh, they tend to be, uh, you know, agnostics or atheists or, or, or some people that haven't really, they don't believe in any kind of, uh, of uh, sort of transcendental thing. But they still can make sense of the world in terms of, you know, uh, 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 interconnected web of cause and effect. Uh, they still accept the Rocklider's insight that everything changes, that there is no permanence in any way, and therefore that it's a wise thing to, to accept that and to expect things to change and not to cling on things as you want them to be because uh, change is inevitable and if you want to resist it, then you're going to just have a miserable life. Mm-hmm. Okay. The uh, You mentioned uh, interdependence uh, as part of the Stoic worldview, that, that, that the fact of human interdependence renders it in your interest to behave in certain ways, including some ways we would call uh, virtuous. Um, for Philo... Uh, this was a big, uh, a big deal. Um, and he, he had, a, uh, I mean, he, 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 he almost viewed, uh, and I mean, this, this kind of really got my attention because in my book, Non-Zero, I had really emphasized the way, you know, as a, as a driving force in human history, the fact that new technologies come along and permit the playing of non-zero sum games on a larger scale with more people and so more elaborate forms of interdependence more complex forms, you know, more, more, uh, social complexity grows in to accommodate this and, and so on. Um, and he really, uh, I mean, he didn't, didn't explicitly include, um, technology, but he did say that like the way, a big part of the way the logos works is that 
different things by meeting each other's needs. Not just humans meeting each other's needs, but humans meeting the needs of animals and animals needing, meeting the needs of humans and so on. All of this kind of interdependence um, drives the was driving the world toward, uh, as I recall, I mean, I haven't really reviewed this lately, but, um, you know, a kind of a global harmony. I mean, he did envision a global democracy as the culmination of the Logos, and there would be uh, harmony, and it was all uh, driven by the fact of just inner practical interdependence. That was an expression of the Logos. So I think of this as, as, as really apt for an era of globalization, when, you know, Interdependence is is uh, you know or the the quest for mutually profitable interdependence drives so much, um, and the world increasingly does seem like in principle a single community, although it's uh, seems in some ways more fractious than ever. But but the technological possibility of a harmonious community is there, and that that is all just strikingly compatible um, with his vision. Yeah, the, I, the possibility of a, of a global community enhanced by or made possible by technology is certainly there. I, w- I would argue that what's getting in the way uh, at this point is mostly sort of ideological and political uh, uh, factions uh, and, 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 of course, as you know, as we know, financial interests that are not in the, in the, in the general interest of the people, but, in the, but, but they yeah. serve the interest of a very few. Very few. But, yeah, the Stoics actually, it's, kind of, it's interesting that you say uh, Potanus was sort of uh, envisioning this kind of global democracy. The Stoics were envisioning what we would call today a global anarchy, because the idea was that once that everybody realizes what the Logos is really about, uh, then, you know, we would agree. We would, would we, There would be no strife, because, you know, I would agree that what I do for you is in mutual interest, and there is no no, no point in, you know, in trying to assert dominance or in trying to, you know, hoard things for yourself. We're all working together on the same boat, in harmony, as you will say. And so, in the ideal, uh, ideal Stoic Republic, which was the, the title, the Republic was the title of, of a book by Zeno of Citium, uh, who was the founder of Stoicism, uh, which unfortunately is lost, but that we only have fragments uh, from later on. And then, uh, so he, he basically said, look, like at that point, everybody, will, everything will be uh, in harmony. People will be working together in common. Things will be in common at a, at a sort of a global level. The cosmopolis. I mean, after all, the word cosmop- cosmopolitan just means that. Well, the, the universal police, the universal city. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the idea is that we will get there. But here's the thing. Um, Heraclitus, I was just rereading before our call today some of the fragments from Heraclitus. And Heraclitus, uh, very wisely, I think, uh, warns, essentially, uh, future generations because he says, look, the Logos is there and we have the ability to understand it. And yet... Most of us go around the world ignoring it and, and you know, pretending that it's not that it's not there. And uh, one can make the further leap and say, you know, the, a lot of the causes of, of strife ever since for the last you know, two and a half millennia has been this lack of understanding or this unwillingness to understanding that we are, in fact, in a cosmopolis and that we all should work with each other. Right. Well, Philo, this was certainly uh, he had ideas about this. I mean, I mean, first of all, I should say. I, I, as I recall, he, he had this idea that the Logos was both, uh, had both shaped everything you see, but there was also a Logos within your mind. It was almost like a fractal thing. Like the Logos in the large sense is the mind of the universe, but because it is what created us, the, there, is the, uh, there is a Logos within you, you know, the, the mind of your body is like the Logos of your body. But... Um, it was, uh, you know, kind of like distorted or obscured by emotions and so on. And the object of the game was to, uh, cleanse yourself to the point where the connection between, uh, this micro logos and the macro logos could kind of be felt. And, 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 and for him, this was like a mystical union with God. Okay, because yeah. and, and and there are hints that he had these mystical experiences probably through, um, uh, you know, like uh, seclusion and and discipline. But but there are some rhetorical flights about 
just living in the pure realm of, I don't know if he says realm of ideas or what, but there's, there's that, there is that kind of idea that, that so union with God becomes uh, a matter of, of, of getting rid of the stuff that's keeping the logos within you from connecting to like the yep. universal logos, which is itself a, a manifestation of God. Of course, both are, but the universal logos is a more direct uh, manifestation of God. Um, and it's ultimately, uh, and, and by the way, Spinoza, by some accounts, had this mystical uh, side yeah. to him. And yes. uh, uh, I, I know uh, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein's um, account emphasizes that. Um, yes. So that's, Let that's me make like, a couple of comments. Of, on what you just said. So so one of the things is, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Plotinus' sort of mystical experiences, right. basically. Uh, Augustine read Plot Plotinus, and, and he tried to replicate Plotinus' uh, experiences, mystical experiences, and he failed. And and actually, that had a major influence on him, because he turned more sharply to his, uh, away from uh, Neoplatonism and to Christianity, mm -hmm. to embrace Christianity, precisely because he failed, among other things. Uh, you mean sort of he, he like tried to? I mean, I mean, did Plotinus spell out the contemplative disciplines he used to? Uh, he kind of hinted at them. It's, it's it's there's no real manual, you know. There is no self help manual, basically, as as we understand it today. But uh, but um, uh, Augustine thought that he had an idea where Plotinus was going with this, and that sort of he tried to, to achieve the same kind of. Uh, contemplative, you know, experience, uh, and by his own account, he failed, and that's one of the, the reasons he turned more toward Christianity and away from Neoplatonism, even though he was uh, influenced by by the Neoplatonists, particularly by Plotinus. But um, the other thing is, uh, a lot of what you just said is also again compatible with with the stories that preceded Plotinus, uh, which is this this idea that yes, we are literally bits and parts of the logos. The logos is in every one of us. And in fact, Epictetus says very, very often uh, in his discourses that you should always have, in everything you do, you should always have two goals. So let, let's say that, you know, his example, I, I love one of his examples, is, uh, is uh, of going to the, to the thermal baths and, you know, because he, wants, he wanted to relax. And then, however, he goes to the thermal baths. And of course, what happens? People start splashing around, making a lot of noise and, and you know, they, they ruin the experience. And he says, well, you shouldn't get upset about these kind of things because everything you do should have two goals. On the one hand, you want to accomplish what it is that you set out to do specifically. So going to the bath and have a good time, for instance. But on the other one, you should also have the, the broader goal of maintaining harmony with the universe. That is, your logos should be aligned with the logos of the universe, right? And so he said, you know, between those two, well, the fact that people are going to splash in the in the in the thermal baths is not really that important. I actually apply that every time that I go to the movie theater, because of course. Predictably, somebody tries to ruin, not on purpose, but tries to ruin my experience by turning on a cell phone in the middle of the movie and glaring at uh, you know, their screen at me. And I keep and I, I channel my inner Epictetus and I say, you know, you have two goals here. One is to enjoy the movie. The other one is to keep uh, in harmony with the logos. And that kind of helps. So wait, so, 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 so uh, and, and the keeping in harmony with the logos is dictating what part of your reaction? Just the, just the. Not not getting drawn into your emotional reaction to the person. Correct. Yeah, it's the idea that you don't you know you realize that, that after all what the guy's doing you know splashing you with water or, or putting out his, his cell phone is really not that important. Right. It's not it's not worth losing your your uh, your calm over it. It's not worth ruining your own experience. So you just say, look, this is the way people work. If you're if he's next to you, you just ask him politely to stop. If not, you just deal with it and. And, and think about other things. It's in the broader scheme of things. Uh, it's not that important. And all you're doing is making yourself more miserable. Mm -hmm. So um, so you mentioned uh, Plotinus, a Neoplatonist, which is close to being all I know about Plotinus. I mean, every once in a while I try to learn more about Plotinus, but I always kind of uh, forget it. I mean, uh, I mean, it got very elaborate, the whole, I remember the whole worldview, but, but without... Getting into that, can you elaborate a little on what you said? I, did you say something about the logos being a connection between the world of forms, uh, yes. which is like the ideal world, uh, I gather, and, and is kind of in Platonic thought associated with the divine? I mean, that that's yeah. the world we can't directly apprehend. If you go back to, to Plato's allegory of the cave, we're looking at the wall of the cave. We are seeing emanations of this world of forms or this ideal world, the world of the divine, but we can't see that world 
directly and and uh and you're saying that um that the logos was kind of a connection correct that's right especially for Plotinus, but also for the early christians in fact um, and, and in fact, not only the Christians, but even later on uh, within the uh, Islamic tradition, uh, they took the logos uh, to be sort of a connection between the, the, the uncreated, that would be God, of course, mm-hmm. and the created, that would be the rest of us, you know, mm-hmm. the rest of the rest of us. Yeah, in terms of Plotinus, yes, he was influenced, of course, by, by Plato, um, and Plato did not really have much of a mechanism for connecting the the, the, the world of forms with the world as we perceive it. He did have this idea, I think it's in the, I'm pretty sure it's in the Republic, uh, that he talks about these, the, the, the demiurge. The demiurge is this minor god or intermediate god that actually makes the universe as we understand it. And it's an interesting idea if you think about it, because one of the problems that Christi- Christian theology often runs into is the, the, the question of evil, right? The, why is it that the world is such a shitty place uh, if God is such a you know all powerful, all good, and all that sort of stuff? Well, Plato and the Neoplatonists had a pretty good answer actually for that one. They said, well, that's because God is out there with you know the the pure in the pure realm of, of, of forms, and then we are the result of the of the action of the of the merge, or as Plotinus put it, the logos, and the the, the merge had. To work with whatever it is that was there, you know. So it's not he's, it's not that he created a sheer universe on purpose. It's just that he he had certain materials and there were certain constraints, and this is the best you can do uh, with it. So don't complain. This is this is a, this is the result. This is as get it as close as you can get to uh, to the real thing, but the real thing itself is inaccessible. Okay, and uh, and as for Christianity's use of it, I mean one 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 use is is suggested by that verse from John. It says. In the beginning was the Word, and and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I think that's the phrase. Now, I think I think John is maybe the gospel in which Jesus is most explicitly equated with God. Right. So it's talking about Jesus and God. And uh, so anyway, in the beginning was the Word. I mean, that's consistent with this idea that uh, you know that 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 that. That God just initially infused the universe with this logos thing, and it was a yeah. manifestation of Him. It was with Him and and was Him in some sense. Um, yes. And then Jesus, of course, is uh, particularly vivid as you know a manifestation of God that's in this world. That 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 right. is that is a link between a transcendent and remote God. Um, and and the world we're in now, it, but I, but is there but there's more than that too. Well, yeah, there is more, but 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 that's the basic idea that you're right. Jesus is literally the incarnation of of this connection between the, the world of God and the world of of you know the terrestrial world of humanity. Um, it's interesting that so you mentioned yeah J- John. So the early the early Christians were a little bit frustrated by the fact that they had to translate the word uh, logos, the Greek word logos. With the Latin, because of course Latin was the, the, the lingua franca in the Roman Empire, uh, but Latin's vocabulary just did not was not really quite as sophisticated as the Greek one. So the word that they used was verbum, and verbum in Latin literally translates in modern language as as word. Uh. But you mentioned earlier that logos didn't mean just word; it also mean, meant counting, and also meant the, the 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 root of what we call logic. There is a reason for that. Um, the early philosophers from the pre-Socratics up until Plato included, they thought that, and especially the Pythagoreans, they thought that counting, that is geometry, mathematics, and all that sort of stuff, is an integral part, it's a necessary part of how you understand the world. Uh, it was not by chance that if you if you entered Plato's academy, you had to, one of the disciplines you had to study, one of the fields you had to study was geometry. Because the idea was, you know, Plato actually thought that Ideally, philosophy could pattern itself un- after mathematics and, and geometry. So that's why the word logos in the Greek is much richer than uh, the one that we got from the Latin and then eventually into modern languages. Just that it doesn't just mean word. It just means a general way of comprehending how the universe works, which mm-hmm. includes words, logic, mathematics. Mm-hmm. Basically, all of what today we use, everything that today we use to understand how the world works. Yeah. And this is why I kind of like, you know, the idea of an algorithm is one way of thinking about the logos because, uh, yeah. you know, it has a logic 
and it has a kind of quantitative aspect, although code isn't code isn't math, but 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 it has you you know it, it has a kind of mathematical logic to it. And, and there's there's one further thing, which is that, and this is a very crude metaphor, but if you want to get back to like what kind of connection with God was meant to be represented by the logos, especially in like Philo uh, of Alexandria's accounting. Um, you could very crudely say, like, suppose you're a character in a video game. Suppose you're like, Pac. remember Pac-Man? Like, suppose you're yeah. Pac-Man. You find yourself in this universe. And you, you, and, and God is, is transcendent. You're, so you're not going to like see God per se. And yet God imparted the divine logic via the algorithm that governs the game of Pac-Man. So, yep. so, um, that's, uh, so by observing the algorithm, reconciling yourself to it, adapting to it, uh, you are in a certain sense doing, uh, God's will and in a certain sense, you're making contact with God, but God being transcendent, it's not a very direct form of contact. Yeah, that's right. So that reminds me of this you know, fairly speculative but rather popular idea these days that was put forth a few years ago by philosopher Nick Bostrom of the, simula- the so-called simulation hypothesis, yeah. right? This idea that literally we are, in fact, living in a simulation in somebody that the, what we call the laws of nature are somebody's algorithm right. and, and programming code. Um, now, I... You know, it's it's an interesting idea. I mean, who knows? It's it's obviously speculative, but it's not a bad way of thinking about it because let's frankly admit that for all our success in science, including fundamental physics, we really don't know why the laws of the universe are the way they are. I mean, this you know, this this is the perennial question in fundamental physics, and physicists keep um, telling us that the answer is just around the corner. You know, the yeah. theory of everything is just around the corner. But in fact, so far, we not only we haven't gotten it, but we seem to be pretty far yeah. from it. So it's you know at that point any any reasonable way of making sense of what's going on here I think it's perfectly ac- right. acceptable like okay if you want to think of the universe that way why not right and a, an interesting thing to that uh, about that to me is like you know in the kind of modern scientific milieu if you say uh, you know like I think there's a god even just a deistic god like I think there's a god that created the universe and then let it unfold you know you probably right. get a lot of blowback but if you say I think we live in a simulation. People go, oh, yeah, maybe so. Well, they're the same, you know, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> fundamentally the same idea, which is that a, a being incomprehensibly more intelligent than you, right, yeah. created the universe you live in and and then let it run and may or may not intervene. Who knows? I don't know what Bostrom thinks about that. Obviously, a programmer can intervene in principle. Sure. But um, so there's there's uh, that's just kind of an interesting um, feature. The, the other thing I was going to say is. Uh, not only do we not know where the laws came from, um, <clears throat> we don't know what enforces the laws. By that, I, I don't mean there must be a God. What, what I mean is, is the following. Is, is First of all, usually when we use the word law, there is an enforcer. I mean, not only in everyday human affairs, if there's law uh, that's going to be uh, obeyed, there must be police and courts. I don't just mean that. I mean, the laws in a computer... We write the laws uh, and put them in a program, but we actually know what enforces them, which is the yep. laws of physics see to it that the code we write is implemented. So in, in that case, you know, the laws have this enforcer, the laws of physics, and that's the way the algorithm, that's the reason the algorithm always does what you expect and, and unfolds systematically. But if you ask, well, why do the, step back one level and go, well, why do... Uh, the laws of physics, you know, is there a need for some meta enforcer that's that's comparable to what the laws of physics do for? And and again, I'm not saying it has to be a theistic enforcer. It could be a metaphysical, sure. another metaphysical uh, stratum sure. or something. If that does that make any sense? Is that something philosophers it, worry it, about? It does. And, and let me tell you something interesting that that um, um, I didn't realize actually until a few years ago uh, when I started looking into these into the idea of sort of laws of nature a little bit more carefully. Um, turns out there, be, there was a, a debate early on uh, during the scientific revolution about whether to even use the word law or not. Hmm. So Galileo, for instance, hmm. was kind of skeptical. He thought that, that um, we should really talk about empirical generalizations, not about law. Uh, while on the other hand, Rene Descartes, who was a contemporary, 
and you know today we we think of Descartes as a philosopher. You know, er, uh, I think, therefore, I am that sort of stuff. But he, he thought of himself actually more as a physicist, uh, you know, natural philosopher than than uh, than a metaphysician. And Descartes disagreed. Descartes said, you know, no, we should talk about laws because there was a lawgiver, of course. Within that that sort of context, uh, we're, th- we're still talking the height of Christianity there. Uh, Newton himself thought of the laws of physics as given by God. He thought that in describing gravity and the way in which, uh, you know, the planets go around and all that sort of stuff, he was discovering some basic truth about, you know, not what we could call natural theology. So, so physics actually did inherit the term law directly from the, meta, the Christian metaphysics. That's interesting. Uh, which, of course, is rooted in the, in the Greek. And uh, so some uh, people meant it to imply that there had to be a God enforcing the laws of science. Yes, and these are not small, you know, these are not minor characters. We're talking uh, Descartes and, and Newton. So no, it's like, you know, I've heard of them. Big, big shot. Yeah, you've heard of them. Yeah. So now today, of course, no physicists, or at least very few physicists, I would think, think of laws of nature that way. They're just using the vocabulary. But the fundamental question remains, you know, why, what makes the laws of nature? Why do they work the way they work? Why do they infallibly work right. the way they work, right? Now, a couple of philosophers recently, uh, as in the last two or three decades, particularly Nancy Cartwright and, and Ian Hacking, uh, actually started questioning that the laws of nature work that way. Uh, uh, Cartwright and Hacking kind of went back to uh, Galileo's idea that maybe the laws of nature are not laws at all. They're, they're just empirical generalizations, that they, they work within certain domains, but they might change over time. Some physicists have gotten uh, under that um, idea as well. Lee Smolin at the at right. uh, Institute, for instance, is one of them. Now, this is definitely a minority position, both yeah. within philosophy of science and within physics. But I find it interesting. I find this, you know, right. because this idea that, well, perhaps the, the way, and actually it works better with your idea of an algorithm, because an algorithm adjusts itself uh, to the situation uh, that, that, um, that unfolds. And so one of the things that... Um, uh, Smalling, for instance, suggests is that uh, uh, what happens is that that um, uh, causality creates, you know, causal causal interactions create certain things, but then those, you know, certain results, certain effects, but then those effects change the environment in which further causal events actually occur, mm-hmm. and therefore you might have a situation where at some point what we call the law is going to start breaking down or it's going to start looking, you know, working in a different way. Who knows? I mean, it's really interesting speculation. And, and of course, uh, Smolin has this idea of cosmological natural selection, according to which universes could give birth to one another, perhaps through black holes. And so over time, you get universes that are selected, rather like organisms under natural selection, to replicate themselves. And so he, he has this idea to begin with, the universes may be unfolding things somewhat like organisms, and it could be that the evolution of the laws... You know, just as the algorithms governing an organism change over time in a certain sense, right? I mean, yep. uh, you know, so it could be, it could have something to do. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, you know, I'm as a biologist, I'm a little wary whenever I hear a physicist use the word natural selection. Yeah. But nonetheless, since we're speculating anyway, <laughs> uh, Smalling's idea is interesting because one of the reasons he got at that is because of his problem of um, uh, of of the fine tuning, what what this is called the fine tuning problem, right? So this idea is how is it that the laws of nature seem to be so adjusted in a way that you know they make possible certain things, including us, including mm-hmm. including intelligent life, etc. And uh, you know, one answer, one classical, the main answer that uh, that these days um, uh, physicists will give is the multiverse. Is this idea that well, there's an infinite number of infinite number of universes, each one is a different set of laws of nature. We just happen to live in, in one that um, you know, that has the, law, the laws that allow these kind of organisms to evolve. Uh, Smolin is, is uh, skeptical of the idea of uh, multiple universes, which he, think, he thinks is untestable. And so his alternative is, is the ones that you just uh, brought up, which is this idea of, of universes that butt from each other through, you know, through uh, black holes. And every time that this happens, there is a selective event that will change the parameters, in a sense, mm-hmm. of, the, of, of, the, of the algorithm. Uh, and the the more stable it happens to be the case, and the more stable universes are the one, of course, that you would expect to survive, quote unquote, right. uh, because they last long and therefore they have more opportunities to generate themselves additional baby universes. 
uh, and uh, an universe with stable laws that that uh, is able to survive for billions of years is obviously the kind of universe where you will find life. You're not going to find life in a universe that, that lasts a, ma- a nanosecond or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned that Jung, uh, and this could be the Jordan Peterson connection. I mean, Jordan Peterson, I gather, gets into Jung uh, quite a bit and, uh, and presumably yeah. archetypes and things. Um, yes. What so you? But you said Jung's uh, use of the logos was a little like aberrant or something. I mean, what 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 can we say about Jung and the logos? So in my in my mind, it is. I mean, you, the problem with Jung is uh, like a lot of early psychoanalysis and a lot of early uh, sort of um, yeah the moder- the early part of the twentieth century tends to be very speculative. You know, Freud for it for, for, to begin with. But um, Jung then tended to be not only speculative, but also going toward the sort of mystical uh, directions. He was very interested in you know, archetype, the idea of an archetype, for instance. Um, so he goes in directions that are either downright mystical or certainly very difficult, if not impossible, sort of to test empirically, uh, which is why one should be ex- skeptical of, of that line of, of thought to begin with. As far as the logos in particular is concerned, uh, Jung thought that the logos... Uh, is the embodiment of masculinity. It's the it's the ra- it's the, the principle of rationality, which is associated with men. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, eros is the embodiment of femininity and 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 uh, uh, emotion. And that's of course in his mind associated with uh, huh. women. So right? logos and eros are the two are two kind of like the yin and the yang. That's exactly right. In fact, it's kind of interesting you say that because he does mention the yin and the yang uh, as a, as a, as an analogy, as a way to, to use, as a way to think about how the logos and the eros sort of interact. But he does see them as distinct, as personified by men and women, and that's where Jordan Peterson gets off. Right? That, so, that is explicitly that's what Jordan Peterson is picking up on. Yes, that's right. Uh, that hint, and it's from there, from that kind of Jungian uh, sort of analysis that he gets these these ideas that are fairly controversial that you know men are again rational strong and so on and so forth and women are emotional weak and so on and so forth which of course you not know, surprise surprise uh leads to the confirmation of sort of classical role models you know uh, uh, sorry not role models but gender model and so on and so forth and so you can imagine why uh, peterson pisses off a lot of uh, people that tend to be on the sort of progressive side of, of yeah. the political spectrum so now uh, Jung it, himself, as I said, is, is was a controversial figure at the time. Um, my sense today, from a philosophical perspective, is that his ideas are essentially considered uh, to be charitable, highly speculative, and to be uncharitable, essentially, you know, sort of pseudo scientific and mystical. Mm-hmm. When you, but at least he was a sort of some kind of a solid thinker at uh, at the time. I mean, at the time, people took it seriously for for reason for good reasons. To sort of riff off of him now, uh, in the way in which Peterson does, which is, uh, you know, people often ask me, you know, so how, how do you characterize Peterson? Why is it that he's, that he's so popular? And what I read of him, by him, I read both uh, parts of his books and watched some of his videos, uh, and I also made a point of actually reading uh, a number of both positive and negative reviews of his books, just to have an idea of what other people think about uh, this guy, and. In the end, you know, if I had to summarize it very briefly, I would say that Peterson is a combination of three things. He says a number of things that are rather platitudinous. They're kind of, you know, acceptable because they're obviously true. You know, like you should be, uh, you know, be responsible, take responsibility for your actions and decisions. Clean, clean, well, up, no clean your room. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, you know, that's what my mother used to tell yeah. me. So, yeah, I, I would. that's, that's not, a, not a problem. And then he mixes that with a combination of strange quasi-mystical notions uh, uh, that he inherits from people like Jung and that he presents in a much more obfuscatory way than Jung. And I don't know if that's because he doesn't understand them or because he on purpose, you know, does it, you know, presents them that way. That I don't know. I don't know the man. And then the third element is uh, these somewhat pernicious sort of social uh, political implications that he gets out of this kind of mix of platitudinous things and of and mysticism. And that's where I think the problem is. That he's very popular precisely because people think that he's very smart. Because, you know, I don't, I don't understand half of what he says, so he must be smart. Um, and, <laughs> um, and he validates certain people's views 
of the world, right? So, so there is, we, as we know, we do live in a society, especially in the United States, where a certain sector of the, especially white male population, feels after under attack, uh, feels like things are changing, and they don't want them to, to be uh, changing because you know they don't take Heraclitus seriously, um, and therefore there's some resentment. And and anybody who speaks to that resentment, uh, especially in a academic, apparently authoritative fashion, then it's bound to be. Uh, popular and sure enough, that's that's what uh, it's happened. That's that. I think that goes a long way toward explaining the Peterson phenomenon. Yeah, he apparently has a. Uh, I mean, his most ardent following, I gather, is kind of young males, uh, or certain young, maybe young to middle aged males, or something. Um, and and I gather, you know, uh, they felt in need of orientation. Um, yeah. And and I guess I, 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 I mean, I know so little about him. I'm learning. I, I just doubled my understanding of him by listening to you for a few minutes. Um, but, but I do think, you know, for some of them, it, it's uh, I mean, there's just kind of clear guidance, you know, like clean your room. I mean, and, and it's not I mean, on the one hand, it is. Yeah, it's platitudinous. But, you know, I mean, who was it who said tend your garden? And he's famous. Was that like Erasmus or Voltaire or somebody who um, yeah, it was? Yeah, uh sorry. Who wrote, I think maybe it was, was it, uh, anyway, some famous French guy. <laughs> um, and uh, It helped if you're French. Yeah, some- and, uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, sometimes like uh, just, just focusing on, on uh, something that sounds simple and mundane is, is important guidance. Um, yeah. But, uh, but I do think, beyond, so, so it gives them, I, I think, I assume it gives them a kind of practical orientation and you may be right that part of the appeal is to old-fashioned, manly uh, virtues, a, a sense of traditional masculine self-conception. It's like you know, don't, don't, don't let modernity talk you out of it. You're a man. Um, right. And then I think for some of them, there is uh, the idea that this is a spiritual endeavor. That that, and this is when I, this is where I gather he gets the vaguest. I've heard a couple of people try to pin him down on the sense in which he thinks of himself as religious. And yeah. it's pretty elusive. Um, but, but I think uh, for some people that's important. Like uh, a friend of mine who's something of a fan of his, uh, or at least some aspects of his thought, uh, says that um, uh, he does things like, you know, there's a little Joseph Campbell in him, uh, yes. you know, right. it's like, like summoning mythical motifs and themes. And then you don't have to necessarily get that clear about what ex- how exactly they're supposed to plug in your worldview. It's just like the very evocation of them um, is right. uh, is something. But like somebody said, he, 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 he does this thing. One of his many riffs is. He says, like, okay, so there's these three parts of your mind, and I don't know what three they are, and they're probably three parts of the mind that you or I wouldn't agree are actually three distinct parts of your mind. But anyway, he says, this one maps to the Father, this one to the Son, this one to the Holy Ghost. So that's like a kind of connection to Christianity without actually making any assertions about the truth in the traditional sense of Christianity. Um, that's, but when I hear that, you're absolutely right. I mean, your analysis, I think, is, is right, right, spot on. Uh, but when I hear those kind of things, I have... You know, my my analytical philosophy mind kind of kind of sort of steps back and it says it's it's the same thing when I hear um, uh, some misguided I think uh, Christian theologians say something like uh, the the particle wave duality of light it's like the dual nature of Jesus Christ it's like no it isn't just because two things are dual <laughs> that doesn't you know that just because there are two things there that doesn't mean that there is a meaningful analogy and the same goes I think with the the, the, the the three things or whatever it is yeah but you're right. That kind of, frankly, in my mind, sort of fuzzy thinking um, is very appealing yeah. because it sounds good. It, it, so, so long as you don't scratch too much below the surface, it sounds good. And you don't need the people to, to, to whom this, this, this kind of uh, approach appeals. They don't need to scratch below the surface. They don't want a deep metaphysics or a deep theology or anything like that. They just want to have a, uh, some kind of validation of their worldview based on something that they think is, uh, you know, either transcendental or, or sort of sophisticated enough that it that it's, you know, yeah. sounds pretty, pretty I mean, good. In my, my own view is, you know, whatever works for people, the question is, is it leading to constructive behavior or not? And I don't honestly know enough about his worldview 
to say. Uh, I, I mean, or I haven't done an anthropological study of, of, of his followers or anything. But I mean, you know, people, uh, you know, if Joseph Campbell does it for you and turns you into a great person, whatever, uh, or Jung, I mean, I, I don't, I judge people by their behavior and not, not not their uh not, not i mean i see their behavior as the important kind of payoff of of their beliefs for my purposes the the other big theme of his is uh is chaos and order and yeah. you know you can see how that i mean that it is a fundamental thing let's face it i mean look around my office it's chaotic i need to impose more order i need somebody to give me that sermon clean up your damn sure. office and yet i think an equal part of his emphasis is probably don't be afraid of chaos. Feed off of chaos. There, There is risk in life. There is, you know, it, I think there's something about navigating the border between order and chaos. Um, and, you know, to get back to the logos, I would say that you might, if you brought Philo of Alexandria back from the dead, you know, he might say, looking around the world, and you say, look, you know, there's all this promise. There's this interdependence. There's these people, you know, doing great things together, but there's this chaos and there's this fighting. I think he'd say to the extent that the chaos predominates, it means you're not heeding the the logos. You're not paying attention to what the logos is telling you about right. how to behave toward one another. And so I'm on board with that. Uh, now, I will have... Oh, I'm on board too. And, and I, w- I do agree that that uh, yeah, people should definitely be judged on the basis of their actions, not not necessarily where they get it. You know, if, yeah. if, uh, I try to be as ecumenical as possible. Uh, if if religion does it for you, by all means, go ahead. If you know, if, if Joseph Campbell does it, go go ahead. Problem is, of course, that certain ideas or certain ideologies do have also uh, consequences, you know, negative consequences uh, for other people and for for society. So you're right. It would be interesting to do a sociological study of uh, Peterson's followers. I don't think anybody's done it yet. Um, you know, uh, from what I see from their reality, as I told you earlier uh, during this conversation, if I feel like I need a boost in my Twitter feed uh, in terms of traffic, then I just talk about Peterson or uh, Sam Harris or Ayn Rand. Um, and so I do get a feeling for what at least some of his most vocal followers um, are arguing. And the kind of things that I do here seem to be uh, problematic because, yes, they're helpful to themselves, but that's also to the detriment, that help to themselves comes to the detriment of others in terms of sort of uh, beginning to view certain other classes of people. And what, what's an example women. of that? You mean the way they talk about women or the way or what? Particularly women, yes. Uh, they, 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 it tends to be that there's a, a serious component of uh, not just sexism, but but misogyny, which, as you know, is a little uh, uh, stronger word, which I do think it applies. I'm less clear about how that applies to you know, things like minorities, for instance, because he, at least uh, these followers don't talk about much about that, although mm-hmm. uh, one suspects that that's also lurking around the, pro- the, the, the corner. But most of what he, sa- he, he himself says uh, when he talks about sort of relations, then then it's about men, this contrast between men and women. In fact, you mentioned chaos and order. Of course, it would come as no surprise to you that order is manly and chaos is, is womanly. So that's, right? ex- and, that's explicit in his worldview? That is, yeah, that's explicit because that comes from... Uh, well, first again, that of comes all, from first of all, I would say, if anything, it's the opposite. I mean, I, know, right? I, I mean, <laughs> the idea that, what, women are more responsible for the chaos in the world than men? Give me a break. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly right. But that does come from Jung. I mean, this is, this is a good interpretation of it. It's an interpretation of Jung. And actually, I didn't know this because, uh, but it also, there's something uh, uh, of along those lines also in Campbell. Um, I, you know, I, I, all I knew about Campbell before looking into Peterson, it was, you know, his stuff about mythology and, you know, his, his PBS series and all that right. sort of stuff, right? Um, but apparently he also uh, held on to certain ideas that translated into sort of more modern terms uh, would in fact imply a significant amount of sort of uh, uh, sexism, if not downright misogyny. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, you do have to wonder whether certain sets of ideas tend to lean in a certain direction. Mm-hmm. And therefore, that's where, uh, yes, they might be helpful to a certain number of people, certain uh, kind of people, but at what cost? Yeah. Um, that's, that's always a question to, to ask. Huh. Fascinating. Well, we've gone over an hour. We should probably uh, call it quits. We could we could say more. But but I do think the logos is uh, 
now I'm going to have to go see exactly how he he makes use of that concept. Uh, but um, uh, but it's a fascinating concept. I do think it's a it's a it's an interesting. Uh, it is the way it's kind of on the edge of philosophy and theology is interesting and has uh, maybe some degree of modern utility. But um, but anyway, right. thanks for uh, bringing your wisdom, as they say in the logos business, to bear on this. Um, and and remind us so. Okay, so people can buy your book, How to Be a Stoic. They can. How right. else can they uh, partake in your Stoic revival? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at uh, M P L U C M P I G L I U C C I, or uh, go to my blog, which is howtobeastoic.org. All right. Well, thank you, and and we'll see you down the road, Massimo. It was a pleasure as usual. Same here.